I want to take a few moments this morning. I know we've had a very full morning this morning. I do have a few things I want to share with you from Hebrews chapter 4. So if you want to take your Bibles this morning, uh, we call this the sword of the Spirit. You're carrying that this morning, hopefully. The Bible, the sword of the Spirit this morning, taking up the sword of the Spirit. Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 12 this morning. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged, or some translations say two-edged, sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Father, I thank you for this service this morning, and I thank you for a, a wonderful time of worship, Lord, a time of communion, and Lord, now we pray that you would speak to our hearts by your Spirit and your Word, in Jesus' name, amen. Some of us love to take that which is simple and make it complex. Is that true in a lot of people's lives today? It's simple, but we just, sometimes we get too wordy or we get too complex. Have you ever heard the phrase, keep it simple, stupid? Anybody ever hear that? Well, I've been told that a time or two myself. <laughs> Some of us love to take what is clear and make it, unfortunately, it becomes unclear. You say, clear as mud. Lots of words to cover something that appears to be quite simple, but we have expounded to the point of complexity. How we love to make those simple things difficult when they should be clear. But now if I confront um, to this morning, if I confront some of us with the expectations of living the Christian life, what are some people likely to say? How many of you just want to live the Christian life? What's the expectations? Well, some people say, well, for a minute, let, uh, let me just think about it. Let me just think about that. That's good for a moment, but you can't just keep thinking about it. You have to make a decision. I think today we have a lot of people that are in a place of indecision. You might know that. Maybe some people you work with. Maybe some in your own family. Maybe yourself. Some will say, well, I just need to take some time and Pray about that. Again, prayer is good, but we also need to act, don't we? Many will respond with doing their best to make complex what is simple, render everything into obscurity that which is clear. Many would look for ways to dodge out of all that is involved. You mean if I follow Christ, he expects something from me? Yes, he does. He surely does. Matter of fact, I'm his servant. You're his servant. Some today look for ways not to do what God wants and calls them to do. But I tell you this morning, God's word is very clear of what we are supposed to do as followers of Jesus Christ. And there is no question. One of the things that helps us in our life of serving the Lord Jesus Christ and following after him is the full armor of God. Now, I didn't use Ephesians 4 as my opening text, but Ephesians 4 shares with us the armor of God. The armor of God speaks to many things about our life. Now, we can get caught up in the rules and the regulations, so we think about all the hard things that we're supposed to be doing and not doing. And I get that to some degree. But God's Word gets right to our heart. And how many of this morning know that when it all boils down to it, it's what's in the heart. He provides many things for us, church. He provides for us truth. How many know you can know truth this morning? People are, we're living in a world, people are like, I don't know what's true anymore. Be careful what you're listening to. Who you're listening to, right? Now, God gives you teachers and preachers and evangelists, people that are trained in the word of God that can speak truth to you. And you know what? I have to give an account someday for the words that I speak. 
He provides powerful tools to us. And one of the tools is this Bible, this word of God that you have with you this morning. It will cut through every unanswered question you have. It will help you dispel confusion. And everything that you're facing today, it's simple. You say, Pastor Dave, have you read uh, Leviticus lately? Have you read some of those passages in the Old Testament? I don't know if I understand all of that. And I'll tell you, it's okay. But we need to learn to study. What does the word say? Study to show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It is God breathed. And yes, we can, we can go about saying, well, I've got the belt uh, uh, of, of, of the truth. I've got the breastplate of righteousness. I got the shoes of the gospel of peace. And I got the helmet of salvation. I'm ready. You're not ready until you have the sword of the spirit. You're going into battle. And I'm going to speak about that in this message this morning, among other things. The Word of God has the power to change your life. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm very frustrated today at a lot of things. Anybody on board on that? I, you know, one of the things that I've shared with, I think, our Thursday Bible study group, maybe I've shared it in a Sunday service lately, is we have a whole generation, If and I'm not speaking... Uh, in an absolute sense, because I thank God for our young people here that know the word. Amen? Amen? But we have a great number of a younger generation, and it creeps up into guys my age, who do not have a biblical view of the world. They don't have a biblical view of the world. And they see things happening and they jump on board of this and they jump on board of that. And whatever the crowd is doing, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that thinking and that idea. And it has nothing to do with the word of God. We need a biblical worldview. This Bible that I hold in my hand that you have with you is more than a book of literature. Although there's literature in here, some wonderful literature to read. We've got the poetic in here. We've got history in here. Do I have any history buffs in here? Man, I love the history of the Bible. I, I love to dig into the history. And I love, if you go in my office, I got history books on the bottom shelf. And I can go there at any time and pull out some of those history books and find the things that I need to know when I'm studying the Word of God with history. This book has a beautiful book, or this Bible has a beautiful uh, book called the Psalms. And how many love the Psalms? You can sing them. Beautiful. This book has worship in it. This book also has the life of Christ and, his, and the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It's got the history of the church. It's got the letters of Paul and of James and of Peter. All of these are in this book, the Bible, the sword of the spirit. The church also, this is a book that tells us who God is. Who is God? Who is the one in whom you serve? Whom is the one, in, as the scripture says in Hebrews 12, uh, 4.13, before him and whom we must give account? I call this a prophetic book. And there's a lots of prophecy in this book. There's a, lots of things, a lot of things that's happening today in the world that you can find reference right here in the word of God. So I can go to sleep at night knowing God's in charge. He's revealing himself to us every single day. No matter what you're facing at work, no matter what you're facing in your family, or wherever you find yourself throughout your day, God is always wanting to reveal himself to you, and he will do it through his word. Have you ever been a place in your life, those of you that have been living for the Lord a while, and you've studied the word, you've memorized the word of God, that you go through a situation that hits you that day, and all of a sudden a scripture comes to your mind. Are you with me? All of a sudden a word, a scripture comes to your mind because you've hit it in your heart. You've placed it where it needs to be. And then when God re needs to reveal himself to you in that moment, boom, there it is. You know why? I'm going to share these with you. Number one, 
The word of God is living and active. Can you say amen to that? It's living and active. It's vigorous. It's positive. Well, there are some things in the word of God that speak of judgment, yes. Speak of consequence for sin and ungodliness. But for the child of God, it's a positive thing. It's a vigorous thing. It's active. And I'm so thankful for that this morning. Because as it's living and active, it's my offensive weapon. Hmm. It's offensive in a time of need of, of attack or going forth with our faith. Again, back referring to the, to the, to the, to the uh, armor of God. You say, well, I've got the belt of truth. Nothing more than to defend myself from people lying about me. It's more than a defense tool. How many of you have ever had people lie about you? Say something that's not true. Well, I got the belt of truth to protect me from it. It's more than that. The shield of faith. Well, that'll give me confidence when troubles come my way and I'll get through it to the end. It's more than that. My word tells me to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. And then there's the shoes. Proclaiming the gospel. Peace is a message about peace in my own heart. But there's so much more than just us. Sometimes we look at the armor of God and we think it's all about us. But really, it's offensive. Moving forward against the enemy. He says, the gates of hell, Jesus said, shall not prevail against my church. But before, he also said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So there's a moving forward on an offensive. How many are signed up to be a soldier in the army of the Lord? Can you say amen? I'm a soldier for Jesus Christ. Therefore, yes, I have the tools. I have the weaponry that helps me as I move forward and not sit here feeling sorry for myself. We miss so many opportunities concerning the armor of God. To take this into battle, to face the enemy. Because again, it's living and it's active. Folks, you're not going to win territory and lives for Christ if you just got the word of God to yourself and maybe hiding it on your bookshelf. Or maybe it's just in a time of serious crisis in your life and it's all about you. It's about reaching the world, amen? It's not about us reacting to what hits us. Folks, do you know of somebody that needs Jesus? Do you know someone? Family, friend, co-workers? You have something that God has given you, which is the word of God that speaks life and hope into people's lives. Matter of fact, when you consider praying for our nation, how many are praying for our country today? You know that our nation was founded on the word of God. On the word of God. That would solve a lot of our problems, wouldn't it? If we would go back to the word of God. We're to do more than keeping ourselves protected, as I mentioned a moment ago. We are to go out, take new ground for Jesus Christ. How many think there's new ground to be taken for the Lord? Oh, I got blessed over a week ago. Man, it's been two weeks now, I think, tomorrow. Julie and I had an opportunity to go to a, a pastors and wives just getaway. I mean, it only lasted not even 48 hours. I, I felt like I was just getting rested. Whoop, here we go again back home. And, uh, but it was good. And I was surrounded by other ministers. And missionaries came. What a, what a joy that was. We're going to have some missionaries coming shortly. Matter of fact, be ready. Next Sunday, our missionary McLean's to Poland are going to be right here in the service. And you don't want to be late because something is going to happen before service actually starts. So now I'm getting you all excited. Hey, guess what? You got an extra hour of sleep anyhow. <laughs> Elijah, Pastor Elijah, if they come early, they can pray, they can get ready, they can move to the front seats, right? No? Oh, you already, you already called them for yourselves? Oh, my goodness. We've got to have a conversation. Yes, we do. But before, so, so missionary. Oh, I was so excited to hear about the McLeans. You know, 
they're dealing with refugees from Ukraine. You do not want to miss it. You don't want to miss next Sunday. It's powerful what you're going to hear. Okay? But I was talking to this other missionary and his wife, and, they're, and I call, anybody under 40 is young to me nowadays. So, so he's a young fella in his 30s. And, uh, and he and his wife have been called to another part of the world to take new ground for Jesus Christ. You'll be hearing from them after the first of the year. They're going to be with us. You know, there's always new ground for Christ. There's always someone that, that has never really fully understood the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you several, uh, several, it's been a few years now, but I told you when we were taking our bus out on Wednesday night, that little boy that got on the bus and looked at me, said, Pastor Dave, I've never been to church before. What's it like? This is a six-year-old, five, six-year-old little boy getting on the school bus on a Wednesday night. Never been to church before. What's it like? Listen, it's in our own back door. It's right around us, whether it's the young or the old. The word of God is living and active. You and I can't afford to make excuses anymore. We must move forward. And the word of God, because it's living and active, yes, it's your offensive tool, but boy, it ought to be speaking to your heart about what you're doing for Christ. We have some who call themselves followers of Christ, who give reasons for not going on the offensive. Some say, I just would soon sit here on the bench. How many of you think the Lions are not going to do very well if they decide they all want to just skip out at a game and sit on the bench? Somebody's got to go on the offense. Somebody's got to be willing to say, count me in. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful. I got a bunch of people here. You're ready to say, count me in, Pastor. We're going to take this town for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to be like the early church who turned their community upside down for the Lord. Well, people don't like it if you confront them about their salvation. Yeah, I know some don't. But that doesn't give you an excuse not to. Everybody has the right to their opinion. Yeah, I know that. But I'm still going to share Jesus with them. Oh, I'm just not comfortable talking about religion to, everybody, to anybody. Oh, time out here. I don't want you going out there talking about religion. I want you to go out there talking about Jesus. Come on. The world's got a lot of religion. So don't buy into that. What has Jesus done for you? You know, at the very end, when we stand before the Lord... It says, these are the ones, those who actually gave their life, it's referred to specifically, who overcame the devil by the word, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You want to win somebody to Christ? Share them your testimony of what Jesus has done in your life. Don't talk religion. Hey, don't say, well, you know what? You can talk, talk up about church, but there's a lot of people that are going to make heaven but they were in church. Come on. You've got to know Jesus Christ. It's reasons sometimes people give for not being active for the kingdom. People that fall into excuses for not being on the offensive with this word of God. It's our tool. It's our sword. It's, again, more than just any other book. Not dusty history. Or, as I mentioned, works of literature. It cuts through the complacency of people. Sometimes you walk into church and go, uh-oh, I wonder what's going to be spoken today. Some people even ask me before I preach, what are you preaching, Pastor? <laughs> what are you preaching? It cuts. Sometimes it encourages us. Sometimes we need a service to just be encouraged. Pastor, you got a word of encouragement today. Pastor, you got a word that edifies. Pastor, you got a word that'll just get us on focus. And then sometimes I say, well, God's given me a word of correction. Oh, I don't think I want to hear that today. <laughs> That's so funny. My, my boys are here this morning. And uh, when they were growing up, living in the house, you're still there, son. That's okay. You keep things fun. <laughs> You're still there. It keeps it fun. It keeps it fun. We have our own special mom, dad, Pastor Elijah. We, we keep the tradition on, oh, Austin. The tradition is family meeting. How many of you think that sounds a little bit, uh-oh? We used to have these family meetings. Matter of fact, 
that when, the, when they were all downstairs at the house, down in the family room and play, play area down there, we'd stomp three times on the floor, right? <laughs> They'd look at each other knowing dad needs a family meeting, right? We'd have those times, and you know, they think, oh boy, we're in trouble. Sometimes it was just, hey, let's just talk about what's happening, what's going on, and where we're headed in the next few days. It was, sometimes it had nothing to do with we're going to have to correct you. But sometimes we approach God that way. Don't come to church thinking, oh man, you know, I'm quaking in my shoes because I, I don't know what's going to happen today. I can't tell you what the Holy Spirit wants to do every service. He's in charge anyway. He, and he might speak to you and someone else says, man, I was encouraged today. Someone else says, man, he preached a message that really cut my heart. You know what? We all need a cutting in the heart once in a while. We all need that. We need a sense of feeling uncomfortable once in a while. But all the more to say, Lord, help me to take this word of God, that which I have hid in my heart as an offensive weapon to touch a life for Jesus Christ. We have children coming in on Wednesday, Wednesday nights. Children come in and sit in these chairs and they're hearing the words of God. They actually are asked to memorize a scripture every single week. Come on, adults. They get a little token, a little prize. You don't need a token and a prize, adults. Come on. You got a reward in heaven. You got an offensive tool to face what's coming your way. Pastor Elijah, the youth downstairs are getting the word of God, and teenagers are giving their life to Christ. Isn't that what it's about? Because they're hearing of the word of God. Now, folks, it's also a two edged sword. The word of God is a two edged sword. Verse 12. The scripture actually says it is sharper than any two-edged sword. How about that? I mean, that baby will cut. We have a need in our office here at the church. Thank you, Mark, for sharpening the blade on the cutter. But I can still run my finger under there and draw no blood. Everybody get quiet. Huh? I want it sharper, you know? Uh, so we're looking into this. But I was cutting flyers. I thought, oh, my goodness, it's not very sharp. How many of you have got some knives at home that need to be sharpened, right? Don't they get it gets frustrating when they don't cut like they're supposed to, right? The word of God is sharper than a double-edged or two-edged sword. Can you put that in your mind? Paul's given us something very vivid about the word of God. It's incredible to think about. Someone put it this way. The word of God cuts forward into the world, but it also cuts backward into us. Reading the scripture again in verse 12, word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. That's what the word of God does. So what's one side of the sword? One side of the sword pierces into our hearts from the throne of God. We mentioned that a moment ago, that you, you're under the hearing of the word of God, and something just comes down and pierces into the heart. It's been well said, and I quote, When you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. Think about it. When you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. I mean, think about that. This word of God is able to make you face yourself as you really are. As you really are. Many people try to write their own Bibles. Come on, church. I'm not talking about different translations. I'm talking about, hmm, how can I write it to fit into my life? They take the stuff they like. Leave behind what they don't like. Somebody has called this cafeteria Christianity. Hmm. Picking and choosing what is attractive and leaving behind what is inconvenient. But what we know is that God's word does understand you to the point that it exposes what makes you tick and cuts through every excuse you can come up with. Every cover up to expose everything about you and who you really are. God's word sees your thoughts, reads your motives and your intentions. This same 
side of the sword that I'm talking about that pierces your heart, not only does it show who you really are, but it causes you to look at what you are doing for him. Now, I could take a whole sermon on that first part of it, but let's focus on the second part of it. I have the word of God. It speaks to my heart, and I ask myself the question, what am I doing for him? Now, it sheds light on priorities. Sometimes all we find ourselves doing is doing, doing, doing. But we sit down sometimes when we read the word of God, we might find sometimes how hollow and empty we truly, really are. We can make things, again, back to the early point of the sermon, we can make that which is so simple about following and doing for Christ so complex, so full of other things. The Bible exposes all that. The Word of God cuts through to the bottom line. And here's what I hear the Word of God saying to me as I want to do something for Him. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. It wasn't until Isaiah came into the awesome, amazing presence of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, you know the story, many of you. And he fell down before the Lord as though dead. And he cried out to God because, he again, he recognized his own sinfulness. Guess what happened? Whoosh! The double-edged sword got into Elijah the prophet. Come on, nobody's beyond the sword. Nobody's beyond the sword. <laughs> the sword of the presence and the word of God got into his heart and his spirit. Oh, God, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He was cut to the heart, and God spoke to him, called him, and in that moment of being cut to the heart, here am I, Lord, send me. Every child of God needs to be in that place. Lest we get complacent, let we get at ease, and our relationship with God becomes nothing more than a form, nothing more than a religious exercise to clock it in for the week. This is what I did for God. I went to church. Did you go for you or for him? You see, this is what the word of God does for us. It cuts it causes us to be still, that we can hear from him. The other side of the sword, the message of the gospel, is that proclamation into the word. It comes my way into my heart, and then it goes out as an offensive tool. An offensive tool. Sharing our faith. The sword, the word of God, speaks to us when it comes time to actually going and visiting someone. Do you have someone you could visit? When it's easy to find ways to argue, the timing isn't right, the mood was wrong, the setting was not what I was hoping for. But the sword, the double-edged sword of the Word of God speaks to our heart when it's easy to reason, well, I'm not a theologian, and I wouldn't want to lead somebody astray. Stop with all of that. Even the heart of a child can understand Jesus. And it's a childlike faith, not a theologian kind of faith, but a childlike faith where people come to Christ and know him. The word of God, his spirit speaks to followers of Christ when they think that all the evangelism activity is for somebody else to carry on and do. Words of Jesus speak to you and I very clearly and they cut right into our heart his calling and commission for all of us. Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So here it is, church. God's word, as we're called to go, cuts through every excuse, every pretense, makes clear everything about his truth. It reveals his grace, his love and forgiveness, and it is your marching orders. It's the sword of the Spirit. 
And when it is shared, it does its own cutting. Think of Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. You know what happened? The outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And Peter's now a new, he's on fire. He's full of the Holy Ghost. And this Peter gets up and he does his first sermon. He preaches to thousands. And you know what the scripture says? They were cut to their heart. When the people heard this, it says, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles and brothers, what shall we do? The same thing happens to anyone that comes to Christ. You know the old hymn, we refer to it lately, just as I am, without one plea. Your blood was shed for me. Listen, unless you're cut in your heart, by the word of God, you're not going to know what it means to be saved. How shall they know unless they hear? And how shall they know unless someone is sent? And so this morning, the word has gone forth to you and to I, and now we take it so that others can experience Christ as Lord of their life. And finally, the word of God calls us to accountability. We see that referenced in verse 13. God's word calls us to be accountable. It says here in verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered. Yes, guess what? Everything in your life. And laid bare before the eyes of him to whom he must or we must give account. So there is an accountability that we have to God. It would be a shame for children on Wednesday night to have this word of God hidden in their heart and we can't recite a verse or two as adults, right? We'll be held accountable for what we have. And so may the Lord help us with this in our life. But yes, accountability that we have before God and because we're a soldier, how many of you know soldiers take their marching orders from God, take their marching orders from the Lord? We're Christ's ambassadors, Paul says in Corinthians. God's word holds us accountable to that. But the challenge is, if we are equipped and we have the full armor of God, then we are accountable to use it. We don't just hold it and admire it, but we use it, both to God and to God's people. And let me just say this as I wrap this up this morning. As an offensive tool, you also have the word of God when you're going to battle in prayer. Okay? Going to battle in prayer. And I have found and marked it down in your own life. If you haven't done this, you need to start doing it. Pray the word of God in your praying. Come on. Pray the word of God in your praying. There are times that I can recount in my life where Julie and I have walked through the valleys of different things in our lives, whether it was a, whether it was a, there were spiritual issues, there were physical sickness issues, there were direction issues we needed in our life, you name it. There were all kinds of things we were going through, and you know what got us through and gave us hope and victory was, Lord, you said in your word... And I spoke it. And I was lifted in my spirit. And the enemy had to flee. Because any doubt or any unbelief had to exit the building. Had to leave my front yard while I was mowing. Or had to flee down the street when I was going for a walk. Had to leave me alone. Pray over your kids the word of God. Come on. It's an offensive weapon. Jesus looked at Satan and said, it is written. And I'm telling you what, there's power in your praying when you pray the word of God. There is hope for families here today. Come on. Whether it's from the war room, have you ever watched that? Or whether it's something else where I've watched about churches gathering around and praying because they thought their church was going to lose out and, and have to fold and have to close the doors. And all of a sudden, the pastor called a prayer meeting. Hallelujah. And God spiked, put life back into that church. And God began to do a work in that congregation. 
you, whatever the situation is in your life, pray the offensive weapon, which is the word of God. Are you with me on it? Say amen. amen. Now, these last few weeks, I've been thinking back over the past 20 years. I've been praying and thinking about our future. We must always be responsible to God. We must all have, we all have something that's been given to us. I'm like, Lord, we need to stay focused. I mean, no, we need to stay focused. It's so hard to get distracted, church. And we need to be responsible to God. We're responsible to our calling and to one another. God has placed us in a community with many needs and with many possibilities. God has given us as a church family wonderful skills, amazing gifts in this congregation. I can't even, I'm so excited, Debbie and Pastor Elijah, about going out there to the property and seeing what's going to happen this year. God's been good. You're stepping up. What can I do to share Jesus? And that whole Christmas journey is about the word of God. Amen? And we're going to do that again for the Lord. Value and gifts to reach others for Jesus Christ. Lord, let us pick up the sword of the Spirit and break new ground for the kingdom of God. And I've been thinking about my own life and saying, God, help us, not only as, as a congregation to stay accountable to each other, but Lord, help me as a pastor to lead you intently in knowing the word of God, challenge you in your walk with the word, walk with God's word, witness for God. In these last days of harvest, the devil is doing all he can to distort the word of God. He's doing everything he can to distort the word, to water it down, to accommodate it to the things of this world. But I still want to hear, thus says the Lord. This is his word. It is a two-edged sword. And it's going to help us in the days ahead. Trust me, friends. So again, let me ask you. And while I ask this, I'm going to have us bow our heads. The worship team would come. And I want to just have us take a moment. And I have three questions real quickly I want to ask you. And the first one is this. We've been speaking again on the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and taking up that sword this morning. <clears throat> I ask you this morning, are you seriously ready now to apply and speak the Word of God as an offensive weapon into your every struggle, your every trial, and your prayers? Are you ready to do that? <coughs> Maybe some here this morning say, Pastor, you know what? I really haven't been taking the Word of God that seriously. I get into my struggles, I get into my trials, I get into my situations, and I'm always looking for answers somewhere else. I've not been praying your Word, His Word. Today, make that your commitment and your desire. From here on, Lord, that's what I'll do. Are you ready to allow the Word of God, the two-edged sword of the Spirit, to cut into the areas of your life that need to change? Even now as the Word is preached, you might be here and you realize that you're a person undone and you need a Savior. You need Jesus. You're carrying the shame and the guilt of your sin. You know your shortcomings. The devil knows them too and he makes you understand that even well with shame and guilt and listen today God has come Jesus has come to set you free it's cutting into your heart this morning and you are like those of the early church that come to Christ and say Lord what shall we do what shall we do come to Jesus this morning would you receive his gift of salvation receive the cleansing of your heart and life today and be made new know what it means to have peace in your life. And finally, are you ready with me to see our church fulfill God's call to take the word of God into our community, to minister to those in need and bring lives to the Savior? Are you ready, my friends? Are you ready, my church family? 
as we walk this life together, as we journey these next days and weeks and months and years together, should Jesus tarry? I shared with you a few weeks ago, I believe we're in the midst of a harvest that's coming. I'm hearing of teenagers giving their lives to Christ on Wednesday night. I'm hearing of children coming to Christ. I'm seeing it happen in our services. We're pressing in for God. We know that God is on the move and that the Spirit of God wants us to take new ground for Jesus Christ. How hunger and thirsty are we for it? Let the Word of God, the double-edged sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is living and active, rise up in the church this morning, I pray. Oh God, I ask it in the name of Jesus. Would you all stand with me this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to open the altar this morning.